how long have you been a consultant at 108 College Street? Well, I have been here since 1999, which means 20 years this year. And it's funny how you end up where you end up, and you often think, what would I be doing? And I never imagined that 20 years ago, this is what I'd be doing now. You know, I was brought up in St. Leonard's on Sea, by the coast in Sussex, and went to school there, and then ended up in university in medical school in Cambridge, and then I worked in Norwich and Ipswich and Leicester, and I never imagined I'd end up here. And when I got my consultant job, I got a letter from this chap called Gilmore, who I'd heard of, but never met. And he suggested I might like to come and join him in his clinic in London. And I have to say, I've never looked back since. And as you get a consultant job, although you've done all your training, and in those days, and it does seem a long time ago, you know, I'd done heart surgery and vascular surgery and bowel surgery and liver surgery and all those things. But then you tend to settle into a couple of things that you enjoy and you find you most comfortable with. So I settled down working here doing breast cancer surgery, a lot of work on, on hernias and groin injuries is what I've ended up doing. What is hernia? Now, when you're a medical student, you get it drummed into your brain that a hernia is, I'm going to put the inverted commas up, a protrusion of part or whole of a viscous through the wall of the cavity that normally contains that viscous. Now that sounds complicated, but a viscous is just any internal organ. So in fact, you can get hernias to the brain because bits of it can force its way out of the skull. You get hernias to the lens of your eyes because the lens can pop out the covering. You can get muscle hernias where the covering, the muscle splits and the muscle comes out. But really what we're thinking about when we talk about hernias are the common ones. And there are three really. There's the, the standard inguinal hernia, the groin hernia, with a lump in the groin. And then nearby that, it's a bit lower down, there's the femoral hernia. And then also we talk about the, the umbilical hernia when you get around your belly button. So those are the three common ones that you see. Is surgery the only way to repair hernia? Yeah, hernias don't get better on their own. They tend to get bigger. As, as time goes by, so there's no tablet or no exercise you can do to stop them or stop them getting bigger. And eventually, they all end up getting fixed and really it is an operation or nothing, to be honest. How many hernia procedures have you performed to date? Oh, goodness. So, on the last 20 years, I've put in over 100 a year. So, that's, you know, getting well into the 2000s. And then during that, during your training, you do probably easy as many again, so, you know, into the thousands, but I have to say, I've no idea, but it's more than enough, I'd have thought. I'm not bad at doing them now. Can hernias be life-threatening if ignored? Very rarely hernias can cause trouble. There was an interesting study a few years ago where people looked at men with hernias, and it does tend to be mostly men, and they put them into two groups. In one group, they all had an operation had their hernias fixed, and in the other group, they just waited to see what happened. Now, in the group where they waited, eventually they all got fixed because the hernias got bigger or they ate a bit and became uncomfortable. So eventually they all got fixed. But what was interesting is nothing dreadful happened. Now, what people worry about are things called strangulated hernias. Now, these tend to occur in big hernias that have probably been ignored. And a bit of bowel gets stuck and the bowel twists and the blood supply of the bowel gets cut off. And that, that is an emergency, but that's really rare. And if you've got a normal standard hernia, it doesn't have to be repaired as an emergency, it can be fixed um, at your convenience, to be honest. It can be done whenever you feel you'd like it done. In a recent article you mentioned women with hernia. Why is it that hernias are associated with just men? Um, how can women detect hernias? And you're right, because 98% of hernias actually carry men. So women only get 2% of hernias, but they get the same sort of ones. And it's all to do with the anatomy of the bit down the groin. Um, hernias tend to occur through weaknesses, and in men and women, the gonads, that's the ovaries or the testicles, they develop at the back of the tummy. Now in men, it all slides outside, and as the testicles come through the wall of the abdomen, they leave a bit of a gap called the inguinal canal. The ovaries obviously stay inside. So in men, this gap in the muscles is much bigger, so that's why most hernias in the groin occur in men. Now, of the ladies who get hernias, most of the hernias they get are still inguinal hernias. About two-thirds of them are still inguinal hernias. But a third of them are these femoral hernias that occur just sort of to the inside of the main vessels that run into the leg, the femoral vein and the femoral artery. And again, it's all to do with the anatomy. There's a little canal there. And in women, because the pelvis is a bit wider, because it has to be because of having children, that canal is a bit bigger. So in women, a third of the hernias are femoral hernias, whereas in men, only 2% of the hernias are femoral hernias. In fact, I've just done 
a man with a femoral hernia recently, I hadn't seen one for a long time. Femoral hernias tend to be more painful because the hole they come in is a bit smaller, so you tend to get on and fix those sooner. But again, most of the time it's just fat. Um, in terms of the umbilical hernias, that's about 10% of hernias. They're probably more common in women. But again, it's down to the anatomy. The, the belly button's a weakness where the cord was attached when you were a baby, and there's no muscle there, it's just a bit of scar tissue. So again, it's an area of weakness where the hernia can come through. Are the symptoms different between men and women? Do you know, they're exactly the same, and we do like to say men and women are the same. I'm delighted to say they're not most of the time, and obviously we've seen from the way they different, get different hernias. There are differences, but the symptoms are exactly the same, so easy to spot in men and women. Is it true that sneezing causes hernia? Are there any other causes? You know, almost certainly not, actually. People talk about coughing and sneezing and lifting weights and so on. And it's probably none of that that causes the hernia. And I suspect that the hernias are, if you like, pre-progadema, they're genetic. They're going to happen anyway. Sometimes you can do something that might bring it on earlier, so you might you know, put something heavy in the back of the car and slip and you get a pain and you notice the lump. But the hernia was probably going to happen anyway. And people talk about coughing and sneezing and smoking. Um, hernias are more common in people who smoke, not because they cough, but because cigarette smoke interferes with the enzymes in the body, the molecules that repair your body. And continuously, your body's being broken down and rebuilt. So my skin is not the same skin that I had a month ago. My bones are not the same ones I had five years ago. They're all different. And because areas of the body are being broken up and rebuilt, the enzymes to do that don't work so well in smokers. So that's actually why smokers get more hernias. And people also talk about straining and constipation and so on. But I think the hernia is going to happen anyway. And these things just might bring them on a bit more quickly. They don't cause it, but they might make it more obvious. What other popular myths have you come across about hernia? Well, the main one I think we covered is they only occur in men, and we've seen that's not the case. Um, the other one's about the causes, but there are lots of myths about what you can and can't do after you've had it fixed. Now, the whole point of having a hernia fixed is you get back to normal, so you do all the normal things you did before. And actually, we like to get you back to normal fairly quickly, so everybody who comes through our unit gets their personalised exercise programme. They get a couple of days off after the operation, but pretty quickly we get them going with exercise and get them going again. Um, my mother, 92, um, who was a nurse, loved to tell me how in her day, when people had hernias repaired, they were in hospital for three weeks, flat on their back. But now we'll get you out the same day and we'll get you exercising in a few days to get you back to normal as quickly as we can. Let's switch gears. Let's get to know the man behind the surgeon. Who is the man behind the surgeon? Oh, gosh. Well, what can I tell you about me? When I was brought up in St. Leonard's on Sea in Hastings, I went to the local grammar school. My mother was a sister in the local gynaecological hospital in the days when towns had different hospitals for different things. Um, my father actually did a few jobs. He came down from the northwest. He was born in Wigan and went down to Portsmouth where he worked as a mortuary. He was a mortician's assistant. And then he worked as well on the coast and ended up in Brighton working in the pathology laboratories in Brighton. And that's where they met. Um, my mother tells me they'd arranged a date and my father didn't turn up. And she thought, well, that's it then. And then when she went back to the ward the next day, he was in hospital with appendicitis, and that's why he hadn't turned up to their date. But fortunately, they got together, and here I am from that. Um, I went to school locally, went to local grammar school, ended up in Trinity College, Cambridge, doing my medical training, uh, which I have to say is a lovely place to train, but it's such a long time ago. Um, and then went around the country, as you did in those days, doing training from Ipswich to Norwich to Leicester to London. I did a research degree in molecular biology of breast cancer. Um, but I'm a probably one of the last generation of fully fledged general surgeons. So having done our surgeon, vascular surgeon, liver surgeon, transplants, and chest surgeon, brain surgeon, all of those things came into the training. But now I've settled down into doing the things that I enjoy most, which are looking after hernias uh, and looking after ladies with breast cancer, although men can get breast cancer too. What is the last book you read? Oh, now this, this is going to bring out the geeky side in me. Um, I'm currently reading a book called Quantum Space by a chap called Tim Baggett. Now, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a closet physicist, really, or astronomer. And I've got a big telescope at home where I live. I had a telescope made and I actually designed and built the dome myself. It's a big 14-foot dome that rotates around when the telescope's in. Um, and it's an interesting design because it rotates on golf balls. And the reason I wanted it done on 480 golf balls is nothing will rust. Now and again you have to grease it, but it's absolutely fine. It's the biggest golf ball designed observatory in the country. Um, and I know that because the late Patrick Moore, the astronomer, was a friend of mine, and I used to see him regularly, 
And I used to write him about it, and he told me it was the biggest one he'd ever come across, so I know that's the case. So yeah, so quantum physics is a hobby, astronomy is a hobby, and the book before that actually was, um, was a book called On Gravity, um, a brief to have a weighty subject, because um, one of the things that I was always taught was to question everything, be curious. And one of the things I'm curious about is how the world works. And I'm interested in how curved space makes gravity. Sorry, I just am. Any hidden talent? Now, my wife, Mrs. Marsh, a GP, um, would, what would she say? Probably upsetting my eldest daughter, actually, although that's not a hidden talent. My eldest daughter's a vet, and she's thoroughly lovely. If you were a consultant surgeon, what would you be? Oh gosh, that's a really difficult one, because believe it or not, I've always said it, you don't have to have a lot of brains to be a doctor, you've got to have a good memory, a lot of common sense. So I'm not sure what else I'd be. Um, I'd have to be a farmer. I mean, we live in the countryside now, um, and we've got, let me get this right, at the moment, four horses, five dogs, seven cats and two pigs, so they take a bit of sorting out. That means I'm usually up at five in the morning doing all that. Pigs are brilliant pets, by the way, but you've got to have more than one, you can't have just one. And the dogs, we've got one dog for each daughter, and then three of them out. Um, I sometimes thought I'd perhaps like to go into astronomy, but I don't really understand the maths. So, you know, I'm not good enough for that. Um, perhaps the armed forces, but then I used to have asthma as a teenager. That would be no good at all, would it, to be honest? Uh, my mother tells me that when I was eight, I said, I'm going to be a doctor and find a cure for cancer. And, you know, I haven't quite done that, but at least I've done the doctor bit. What days are you at 108? I'm at 108 half the week, so I come on Monday afternoons where I'll see patients and then I get up very early on Thursday, so I'm here by quarter to seven in the morning and I can see people on Thursday morning. I tend to operate Thursday afternoons, I stay in London Thursday nights, so I'm always here. And then I'm around Friday to do more consultations and tidy up and do paperwork and occasionally make videos. Thank you, Mr Marsh. Thank you very much. Aww.